Good afternoon. My name is Kent Warman, and I'm the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee, known as the Dr. Cog TAC. I call to order the November 15, 2021 Dr. Cog TAC meeting. Dr. Cog uses a digital platform, Zoom. Members and alternates, you have the ability to mute and unmute yourself and share your webcam. We ask that you raise, use the raise hand button and indicate you have a question or would like to speak for an agenda item um, with questions or comments. Please make sure that you've, your type name reflects your first and last name in your representation. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the Q&A box. Again, please use the raise hand feature to ask any questions or make comments related to agenda items. At this time, Cam will list all attend uh, all uh, members and alternates. If for some reason you do not hear your name, please email Cam at ckennedy at drcog.org so your name can be added uh, for the record. Cam, if you'll do roll call. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, in attendance for members and alternates, I currently see Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, David Gaspers, Frank Bruno, George Hollenkoff, Jean Sanson, Jessica Furco, Kent Mormon, Kevin Ash, Mac Callison, Melanie Chiquette, Ron Papstorf, Rob Zuccaro, Rick Pilgrim, Sarah Grant, Steve Durian, and Walter uh, Wirt. Those are the uh, members and alternates I see at this time. Oh, and Brooks uh, Svoboda and Alex Headright have joined us. Those are who I see at this time, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Cam. Um, I'd like to, uh, is, is I understand that unfortunate for us, uh, this is TAC member Carol Buchanan's last TAC meeting as our seniors Special interest and representative. Carol, we're going to miss you, your input, your insights on the issues that have come before TAC, and we wish you well on your new Avengers. I also believe Jacob Reeker would like to say a few words. Jacob? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, just want to recognize Carol's service, you know, both to Dr. Cog, but really to the region. Um, Carol's been at Dr. Mack, the Denver Regional Mobility and Access Council, for a very long time one of the region's strongest and steadiest advocates for um, you know, individuals with disabilities, other vulnerable populations when it comes to transportation. Um, you know, Someone that I've looked up to, I cannot imagine Dr. Mack, I can't imagine this region without Carol, but we're gonna have to try somehow. So Carol, I just wanted to recognize you on behalf of Dr. Cog's staff and say thank you so much for everything you've done for the region, for Dr. Cog serving on TAC. It's been an absolute pleasure to work with you. We're really gonna miss you. Um, so Carol, I don't know if you, I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you want to say anything, but we just wanted to take a moment to recognize your service to the region. Here. Thanks. Oh, I was going to say thanks, Jacob, and thanks, Mr. Chair. I, being a part of Dr. Mack and working in the Denver region for people with mobility challenges has been a really meaningful part of my career, and I just encourage you all to continue to support um, the increase in funding to the tip set aside for human services transfer transportation. The need is great to assist those with mobility challenges to get to those places that keep them healthy and productive. And um, so just keep up the good work. Thank you, Carol. Uh, we will try and, and, and try to continue that uh, as, as we move forward. We now, uh, we will now open the meeting for uh, public comment. And uh, if you have joined by a computer, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button and we will call on you to begin speaking. If you have joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine and we will call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. Staff will unmute you and um, then you will need to unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. If you have, you will have three minutes uh, to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up and your line will be muted. As a reminder to everyone, 
After public comment period, only TAC members and aldermen will partake in the discussions regarding each item. So with that, um, see if we have any hands raised. Uh, please raise your hand if you do want to make public comment. I am not seeing any, and I do not see any uh, uh, phone numbers. Oh, we do have one. Um, yes, uh, Riley Wharton, please go ahead. And Riley, you might need to unmute on your end. Yeah. There we go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay, sweet. Um, I didn't necessarily prepare for this comment, public can't hear it comment, but I noticed on the regional plan to 2050 that the best rapid transit uh, regional plan was included, uh, done by RTD. And that made me actually quite excited. Um, so, uh, but I also noticed that a lot of the bus rapid transit routes weren't going to be established until uh, the 2040s or even the 2030s. I was wondering uh, why that was the case and what could be done to uh, get some of those bus rapid transit routes uh, a little bit more higher priority than uh, some of the other projects in the Denver region. That was my question. Okay. Um, thank you for your comments. Um, Jacob or Ron, would you like to respond? Everyone? Yeah, I'd be happy to respond, Mr. Chair. Thank, thank you. you very much. And Riley, thank you for attending today and for providing your comment. We really appreciate it. Um, quick answer to your very good question is that uh, the plan that you're referring to is our 2050 regional transportation plan. It's a 30 year long range plan. Uh, tries to be really visionary, visionary and all-encompassing in terms of the transportation investments in this region over the next 30 years. As you can imagine, a 30-year plan um, takes a lot of time to build out the networks and the projects and the investments that are contained in that plan. So as we put the plan together, we tried to think about sort of a logical staging and sequencing of projects, recognizing that some projects, you know, have been, work has been done for a number of years and they're on their way to implementation. Other projects, you know, regardless of mode are little more than, you know, sort of concepts at this point, right? So specifically regarding the bus rapid transit network, the logic was that, you know, we want to do one of these every say five to six years or so, so that over time of the 30 years of the plan, we actually build up that network. So some of the projects are staged a little bit sooner, such as Colfax BRT, State Highway 119, et cetera. Some of them, again, are more conceptual, um, planning and project development work needs to be done. So they're going to take a little bit more time. So again, it's really just sort of recognizing where these things are and then building them up over time to build that network by 2050. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, it, it does quite sufficiently answers my question. It just, it just feels like I just, <clears throat> I'm just not used to the slow pace of, uh, of construction, I guess. Uh, and also I've, I also noticed that BRT tends to take uh, shorter construction and also it tends to be a lot simpler to construct than even a light rail line. So that's why I asked the question. Thank you, thank you Riley. I do not see any other hands raised at this time. Um, thank you. Uh, with that, we will uh, move on to the October 25th uh, TAC meeting summary. Um, are there any discussions, corrections, um, or questions about the summary? Hearing none um, and seeing no hands raised from the TAC or the alternate members, the, they stand uh, approved as uh, written. Thank you. We will now uh, move into the um, action items and uh, Josh Flink will uh, be making a presentation on the 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program amendments. Josh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I do have two proposed policy amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program for tax consideration this afternoon. 
The first is an increase of funding for the Central 70 project. Um, this is an increase of $15,059,000 in TIFIA funds based on updated uh, debt estimates and to bring the funding amounts in the TIP in line with the funding amounts in the TIFIA loan agreement. The second uh, proposed amendment is a scope change for the HOP Transit Service Expansion Project in the city of Boulder. Uh, the city has requested this scope change really due to the impacts of COVID-19, which we see both locally as well as around the country, uh, that really make it infeasible to expand transit service uh, in the uh, immediate uh, future. Uh, so they are looking to uh, repurpose the multimodal option funds that were awarded to this project for battery electric bus purchases instead. Um, included in that would be an increase in state faster transit funds of $323,000 and uh, settlement funds of $1,745,000. Uh, so I'd be happy to take any questions on either of those. Otherwise, I do have a proposed motion for, available for you on your screen. Are there uh, any questions? Uh, Rick Pilgrim, go ahead. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Uh, Josh, just wondering, uh, I, well, I'm, I'm excited and encouraged to see uh, that we're adding battery electric buses to uh, certain fleets. Is, is the, it seems like this might be just the start of a conversion or is this more of a demonstration project? Can you can you put some context to the electric battery bus uh, program and, and tell me where that's headed over the longer range? Sure, um, I believe the ultimate goal of the city of Boulder is to electrify um, all of the buses for the uh, hop service. Uh, at this time, they are looking at uh, purchasing charging equipment as well as uh, I, I want to say it's five or six uh, battery electric buses as part of uh, this scope change amendment. Uh, great, that's good news, thanks. Thanks, Rick. Um, any other uh, questions, uh, please raise your hand. Seeing none, uh, I'd entertain a motion and a second for approval of this agenda item. Um, please use your raise hand icon to indicate you would like to make the motion. Brian Weimer, go ahead. Uh, yes, I'd like to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the attached amendments to the 2022-2025 Transportation Improvement Program. Thank you, Brian. Is there a second? Alex, hide right. All second motion. Been moved and seconded. Is there any additional discussion? Please raise your hand. Seeing none, we'll go ahead and proceed with the vote. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed signify by saying no. Are there any abstentions? Seeing no abstentions and no, no votes uh, passes unanimously. Thank you. At this time, we'll move into our informational briefings and we'll continue our discussion on the draft fiscal year 2024-2027 TIP policy. Todd, if you'd please lead us in that discussion and presentation, right. thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a continued discussion um, from your October 25th meeting. Um, at that meeting, we had introduced the draft TIP policy um, for your comments and discussions. Um, so today we continue that discussion. Um, so just wanted to go through a few updates that have taken place since the last draft, draft that you saw. The first three bullets um, that you see on the screen um, are in response to the comments that we heard at the last meeting. So um, in the text concerning capital project eligibility, uh, we did revise some text um, within a paragraph. Um, within tables three and five, we adjusted the titles of those to add regional and sub-regional. 
Um, then also within Appendix C, we remove a duplicate project. Um, since your October 5th meeting, we have also um, added additional text um, regarding sub-regional forums, essentially saying that if a forum is taking action and voting on an item, that item must, that action must be contained within a forum meeting and cannot happen outside of an actual in-person or virtual meeting. Essentially meaning that if you're going to um, have a future vote that's just over email, that would not be allowed. Um, if you still would like to pull members, um, you certainly could do that, but there could be no action uh, incorporated into that conversation. Um, so beyond additional minor edits that we've made, uh, we've also made one holistic um, change to the document. Um, and truthfully, this is more of an action and change in the document that's going to affect Dr. Cog's staff time more than anything else. But we've essentially removed any references to the 24 to 27 tip. Um, therefore, this policy changes over into a document that could be used for any call for projects or any tip development that Dr. Cog essentially conducts and goes through. Um, this will allow, at least on the staff perspective, um, a quicker turnaround and less changes overall to the actual document. Um, of course, we are not removing and there will still be chance for um, both technical and policy level discussions to take place before any um, policy needs to be uh, discussed and then perhaps uh, amended. So starting with this document, um, this is the document that will be replacing the 20 to 23 cycle uh, tip policy document. But going into the future, we envision this document um, only being amended um, and not being um, essentially the old document thrown out in a new document being adopted. Um, so hopefully that doesn't get, get too confusing, but again, it's, it's more of a, a chance for this to be a living and breathing document where um, it's valid for any calls for projects or anything that Dr. Cog does. We can still amend it whenever we want, um, but most likely that occurring around um, those times that we actually have um, a tip call for projects coming up. So um, with that, I will open it up, uh, Mr. Chair, for anyone if they would like to have comments, um, further comments on this document. Um, so just as an FYI, so everyone knows, at your next meeting, we will bring the TIP policy and the applications, which those two will be combined into one document that Josh will cover in the next item. Those will be brought to you for recommendation um, for adoption. So with that, be happy to take any comments or question you have within the attachment. Are there any questions or comments? If so, please raise your hand. Alex Hyderite, please go ahead. Thank you, Alex Hyderite, Boulder County. Um, thanks, Todd, for the overview. Um, I had one comment um, in part 2B, the requirements and commitments for all TIP projects. Um, it looks like there is a placeholder that if the CDOT greenhouse gas reduction rulemaking does indeed pass, um, that we would look at incorporating that into um, this section of the TIP policy. Um, and I wanted to voice my strong support for that action um, and I guess I'm a little unclear on the timing if, um, yeah, that, uh, yes, that's the, the comment I was referencing. Um, I'm wondering, has Dr. Cog prepared any draft language for what that incorporation would look like um, if the greenhouse gas rulemaking does pass or when, uh, when we would get a look at um, what sort of language we could incorporate on the TIP policy that would um, reference the, the greenhouse gas rulemaking? So I believe at this time, and uh, I might have Ron correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's January or February before the rulemaking is potentially um, looking to be approved. And no, uh, staff has not drafted any language that might be incorporated into this section if it were to pass. Um, however, we certainly can bring that back um, as an amendment to this document as necessary. Okay. My, my understanding is that the Transportation Commission is going to be voting on it in December. Um, so just hoping that if indeed it does pass, that um, staff could look at language that would reference it in the TIP policy. Certainly. Alex, this is Ron. You're right. The, the commission is 
commission anticipates considering the proposed rule for adoption at their December meeting, I think December 16th. Um, I think we, you know, obviously we've seen a revised proposed rule. Um, I, I think at this point, based on the revised proposed rule, as long as any, any final changes before the commission um, considers it for adoption and actually adopts it, I don't know that there will be significant or, or potentially any sort of changes to the TIP policy um, that, that will affect the TIP itself. Um, there will be obviously um, a lot of work when we adopt, when we adopt a next TIP around an analysis of the TIP. Um, so, um, but for the first phase next year, I don't anticipate significant changes. The rule wouldn't take effect until I think the middle of February if the if the commission adopts it in December. But that's sort of a sequence issue. Once they once they've taken action on the rule, uh, we'll do whatever's necessary in, in preparation for the for the tip cycle. Okay, no, I appreciate that it doesn't impact um, the tip policy, but certainly will impact the project selection. But I think it would be good for the tip policy to reference that as a um, a requirement and commitment that applies to all projects. Thank you, Alex. Just, just to sorry, just to just to clarify, Alex, the nothing in the nothing in the greenhouse gas rule that's under consideration or under developed by CDOT now affects specific projects. It affects plans and the tip as a whole. Um, but but I think I understand your your general point. But I just want to be I want to be very clear about what the rule does and doesn't. Thank you. Thank you, Ron. Are there any other questions for, um, for Todd? Please raise your hand. I'm not seeing any. Todd, could you expand a little on why you won't, you don't think we should have voting by email or polling? Just, just what the staff's thoughts are behind that, just so in case we're asked by our elected officials why. Right. I, I think it comes down to the um, the lack of the public in the ability to hear any comments or are heard in, in regards to the action that's being taken. So if that action, therefore email vote, is being taken offline and outside of a meeting, the public isn't doesn't have the ability to make any comments. That, that, that's a good clarification. Just was curious on that, Todd. Mm -hmm. Are there any other uh, questions or comments about this? Just a reminder uh, from what Todd said, we'll be voting on this in December, uh, most likely. So um, you've all had a chance to read it. Um, if you do have any further questions, Todd, uh, for them to email you on that? Certainly. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll move on to our next uh, informational briefing then, uh, the discussion of the draft tip applications. And I understand uh, Josh Schwink will be presenting this. So Josh, uh, the floor is yours. Sorry about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, and you should now be seeing a presentation. Um, so I'm just going to give a high level presentation on the draft applications. Uh, the, the draft applications themselves are included in your agenda packets, so uh, you can review them in more depth. Um, something to keep in mind uh, within those drafts, uh, anything that's currently highlighted, uh, those are just updates that remain to be made. In most cases, that would be for instance, a due date, which we will fill in for the specific call for projects uh, when that time comes. So um, the basic application structure that is proposed would be four sections. Uh, the first covering sort of the regional impact of the project. The second covering the six uh, priority areas that are included in the 2050 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. And then uh, another section covering uh, leveraging of funds followed by project readiness. And I'll go through each of these sections in a little bit more depth now. So uh, the regional impact section, we're proposing a section weight of 30% of the total project score. This is similar to the regional significance section that was included in uh, the last call for projects, uh, just some revised wording there. Um, the focus is going to be very similar to that section that you saw on the applications in the last call for projects. So asking about uh, the importance of the project to the region, 
collaboration across municipalities or subregions, uh, solving regional problems, impact on disproportionately impacted and environmental justice populations, what was previously referred to as vulnerable populations, um, and then progress toward sort of the overall regional vision that's established in our Metro Vision document. The next section is drawn from the 2050 RTP um, and focuses on the six priority areas that are included. Um, so that you can see those on your screen. It's safety, air quality, regional transit, active transportation, freight, and multimodal mobility. Um, so within each of those uh, priority areas, sponsors will have the opportunity to answer in sort of a variety of ways. Uh, there will be sort of a series of check boxes, uh, yes or no, if your project addresses uh, some key geographies or other important issues that are identified in several of Dr. Cog's regional planning documents. Uh, there might be some data tables as we ask for some specific data relevant to your project location. And then of course, uh, an opportunity for a narrative response. Um, and that narrative response will be where your, uh, where your score is drawn from. So ultimately, we're looking for you to incorporate references from the data tables or checkboxes into your narrative response and really talk about how your project is addressing those things that you've identified above. Um, the proposed section weight for this section is 50%. Um, and in this case, uh, we are looking for sponsors to address as many of the six RTP priority areas as possible. So in the project leveraging section, we are proposing a weight of 10%. Um, and similar to in previous applications, we're looking at the uh, percent of outside funding that is brought to the table as part of your application. So in this case, uh, from the regional share application, looking at the percent of non-regional share funds. Um, one thing to point out with uh, the, the draft table on your screen is that because the regional share um, minimum match requirement has been dropped from 50% to 20%, you'll see that uh, points will be provided for any match that is above 20%. And finally, the project readiness section. Um, this section is also a proposed weight of 10% of the project score. Um, it's really looking at uh, some common pitfalls that have been identified uh, and seeing if the project sponsor has sort of done some uh, front work to identify those and potentially mitigate any issues that have been, that have been identified. Um, there are a series of checkboxes again, sort of yes or no questions about whether an action has been taken, but then also an option for a narrative description uh, where a sponsor can go into a little bit more detail onto why uh, an issue either has or hasn't been addressed so far, um, just so that reviewers get a full sense of where their uh, project status is going in to the application. So I wanted to just discuss scoring methodology a little bit um, because I know uh, this has evolved a little bit over time and we've shared a couple different methodologies with sponsors so far. So the uh, current proposal is that each section, all, all of the four sections of the application will be, will be scored on a scale from zero to five and that any uh, zero answers will be incorporated into the average score for that section. So uh, as an example, with the RTP priority section, um, each uh, priority area would be scored between zero and five. Any that are left totally blank um, would be given a zero and that zero would count in the overall average score. Um, again, I mentioned this earlier, but the checkboxes and data tables help to provide that context and hopefully um, help to guide the uh, applicant in providing their narrative answer, but the narrative is where the ultimate score will be derived from. Uh, that said, I think uh, in order to be considered for uh, full, uh, full five points, we are going to want to see that the question is fully answered, including um, answers to any of the data tables. Um, 
And then I know I just gave an update of the overall application structure that does apply to both of the proposed applications. So we are proposing two separate application tracks. One, the STBG track for the Surface Transportation Block Grant funding. That is the most flexible funding uh, source from uh, the federal government. So um, the eligibilities for that application will remain the most flexible. But then we also wanted an air quality and multimodal track, uh, which will be using funding from the CMAC program, uh, transportation alternatives, the state multimodal options fund, as well as uh, the potential um, new federal uh, carbon reduction program. Um, so the main difference between these two applications is simply the removal of ineligible items from the air quality and multimodal application. Um, that is primarily roadway capacity expansion as well as roadway and bridge uh, reconstruction. Um, so with that, I'll open it up for any questions or comments tech members have on the proposed draft applications as they stand at this time. Are there uh, any questions for Josh? Please raise your hand. I am not seeing any. I did have a question on A4. Is that data going to be supplied by Dr. Cog or, or will that be individuals, uh, jurisdictions pulling that information together? So for all of the data requests, um, we are looking as we've done in the past of having uh, data, data sets available um, from the Dr. Cog regional data catalog. So sponsors will be able to download those and uh, review those. We are also looking at, and I don't want to sort of count our chickens before they hatch, but um, our GIS team has been doing a lot of great work setting up a tool that will hopefully uh, help sponsors to really easily do some of those data calculations through a web map um, simply by uploading a GIS shapefile or potentially even drawing their project on the map. And then it will provide all of the um, relevant data that's requested in the application for them. And then the second question goes uh, down to un be under safety. You have, again, a data request there. Um, will there be a specific year? year? Um, for instance, you may have 2019, but jurisdictions may have up through last month. What, um, so the, so what will be used, I guess, is the question, or will it be allowed to mix 2019 and 2020 and 2021 data and possibly 2022? So um, we are looking to request, I believe it's 2015 to 2019 data. Um, and that's just to ensure that it's, it's apples to apples across the region, that what we're looking at is sort of the same um, some agencies might have more recent data, but that's uh, the most recent data that's available to all agencies across the region. Okay. Alex, I see, hi, right, I see you have a question. Please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you, Josh, for the overview. Um, I, overall, this looks like fantastic revisions to the application. Um, I think in particular, um, the regional priorities section, the, the bulk of the score, I really like how that aligns uh, with the RTP and then the reference to all of the, the other Dr. Cog plans that have been adopted. Um, a couple of questions and comments. Um, in the air quality section, um, one of the project elements uh, listed, and I think referring specifically to the air quality and uh, multimodal options call, um, examples of project elements include vehicle operational improvements, and I guess I'm not quite sure how vehicle operational improvements that would make it easier to drive will lead to air quality and greenhouse gas improvements. Um, so just wondering what the, I guess the, the rationale for including those project elements as being able to score points in the air quality section, if you will. Sure, so we did want to um, include any items that are eligible under any of uh, the funding programs that are being included within the air quality and multimodal uh, application track um, within the CMAC program uh, that does allow for vehicle operations improvements so long as there is no increase in vehicle capacity. Um, so those might be 
uh, changes to an intersection, um, an intersection alignment to make it uh, more efficient, signalization, things like that. Um, so there would still be no uh, increase in capacity permitted, uh, but we did uh, continue to include operations because that is something that is eligible under CMAC. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the regional transit section, um, referencing the goals from the multimodal options fund, is it possible to add a question or two um, related to how the project would provide transportation to disadvantaged populations, including seniors, persons with disabilities, children and minorities, um, low income and uh, limited English proficiency? I'm just wondering about the, the possibility of adding a question or two in the, the transit section that addresses the project's nexus to those um, populations. Um, yeah, I, I think that's something we can we can certainly consider including. Um, we, of course, have the uh, um, disproportionately impacted and environmental justice question uh, in Section A, um, but I, I think including that under some of the uh, other priority areas, uh, including regional transit, might be uh, something that we can consider doing. Okay. Um, and then in part D, um, there's in question A, um, there's a question about has the project been reviewed by, I think, a licensed professional engineer, a language to that effect. Um, for a transit operations project, for example, I don't think there's a not applicable option in the application currently, and it would seem like for some project types, having a licensed engineer would not apply. Um, for, for other questions, there are a does not apply answer provided in the application. I'm wondering if um, we could look at adding that one to that question as well. Yeah, we can, we can consider that. Um, I, I think that, as you mentioned, that would make sense uh, for, for instance, a, yeah, a transit service. Um, project may not uh, have plans for an engineer to review. So I think that might be something we can incorporate. Okay, and then my last question, and I know our six regional priority um, names are drawn from the RTP, but if the um, CDOT greenhouse gas reduction does pass, wondering about the option for us to rename the air quality section to air quality and greenhouse gas reductions. Um, I believe uh, the current, um, description or, or possibly the language in the question under that section does include reductions in greenhouse gases. Um, I, I don't know about changing the priority name because we do wanna tie that back to the RTP and have that clear connection. Um, but, but certainly I think it, it, we are looking uh, where where greenhouse gas reductions would fit into the application would be under that um, mm -hmm. area. So we can definitely look at the language in there and make sure that that's included in some fashion. It is in the list um, after carbon monoxide and ozone precursors in particular matter. I guess the okay. where I'm coming from is just now that transportation is the largest um, sector for greenhouse gas emissions, any opportunity to elevate the role of, tra of the transportation sector and contributing to greenhouse gas to, to highlight that nexus. Okay. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll discuss that and see if that's something that we can do or uh, otherwise change the language to, to highlight that possibly. All right, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Brian had a comment. Um, what is the status of the sub-regional applications and the time frame for sub-regions to provide their own criteria? So the uh, proposal um, for the sub-regional application, similar to in the past, uh, would be for the for a revised version of the regional share application to be used um, and distributed to the sub-regions. They would then get the opportunity to uh, look at changes to those, including additional criteria. Um, I believe we are looking to distribute a draft schedule out. And, and Todd, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I want to say in the next week or two, uh, we will have that available and distributed to all of the subregions so that they can begin planning uh, their subregional forum meetings uh, over the course of the call for projects. Um, but I think we are still doing a little bit of last minute internal review on that to make sure that it's totally uh, accurate. Okay. 
Thank you. Um, Deborah Basket had a question, had her hand up, a comment. Go ahead, so, Deborah. Hi, Josh. Don't think we've actually ever met, but we will one of these days. Thank you for your collaboration. It must be very hard to work with a virtual group of people. I'm pleased with how the process and dialogue are going. My question actually has to do with us getting our acts together in anticipation of the application. So I always get stuck on finding some of the data sets that I should look at now to determine the viability of my project, particularly DEI and environmental justice. So where do we go now to um, try to evaluate our projects ahead of time if they're a good match for this? So currently available on Dr. Cog's regional data catalog, we do have our vulnerable populations data set. Um, I believe that is 2015 to 2019 data, which will be um, what we intend to incorporate into this application cycle, just because there's a bit of delays on 2020 um, American Community Survey data being available. Um, as I mentioned, we are working on that tool that sponsors might be able to use through a web map uh, to identify that data as they're applying, but that is a data set that's currently available on the data catalog that you can download right now and begin um, sort of evaluating that. Um, and I, I should be able to possibly uh, look that up and provide that link to you uh, in the chat here in a second. Thank you very much. That magical tool would be really great to draw a box and have it all pop up. Thank you for your help. Thank you, Deborah. I, I would agree if you could put that uh, in the chat or, or send it out, it would be great so that we could start evaluating some of those. I do not send any additional hands raised. Um, Deborah did not mean to cut you off if you had additional questions. Um, and, no additional uh, questions. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Todd, I see you have your hand raised. Go ahead, Todd. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, so I just wanted to take this opportunity since we have everyone here as a group, uh, maybe just to kind of walk through a couple of the next steps. Um, so exactly what Josh said, um, hopefully by the end of this week, we will be emailing out to the forums a sort of a master schedule that will at least cover the regional and the sub-regional call for projects um, for the 22 to 24, uh, 20, yeah, 25 tip. Um, this will cover essentially the regional call that will plan to open at the end of January through the end of next September, um, when we will um, amend the projects into the current tip. Um, as part of what will be coming out will be a list of forum discussions and or actions that will need to take place. Um, so for example, I'll, I'll take Brian's question as, an, as a perfect example to note. Um, as of right now, the schedule is looking like we will open up the sub-regional call for projects in early May. And by, I'd say late April, we will staff, Dr. Cog staff will need to know from the subregions that if they do uh, intend to adjust that subregional application, we will need to know by then. So again, expect that hopefully later this week. Um, and I will also plug that along with the schedule, anticipated schedule for the next two calls, um, we will also be incorporating and sending out um, a schedule for the anticipated amendment to the 2050 RTP. So um, hopefully with these two big things going on within the next year and two years, um, hopefully this will help explain a little bit more um, and prepare each of your forums um, ahead of time of what is to come. And Mr. Chair, if I could supplement Todd's comments real quick. Todd, thanks for mentioning the RTP schedule. We are going to send those both out together so that you all get a sort of integrated snapshot of the two major projects we'll be working on as we come into 2022. Just want to add to that by saying that at the December TAC meeting, we're planning to have on your agenda uh, an informational item that will start giving you a more detailed preview of the process and timeline uh, for doing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan update that's required of us uh, through the Greenhouse Gas uh, rulemaking uh, that we'll be doing in 2022. Thank you, Jacob. And thank you, Todd. Are there any additional questions regarding the uh, um, 
application or the uh, yeah, the uh, application or or any um, part thereof. Seeing none, I'd like to thank Josh, Todd, and uh, Jacob for for uh, discussing that and the questions that came from TAC. At this time, uh, we'll move on to the Older Americans Act, um, human, human Services Transportation Set Aside, and the Federal Transportation Administration 5310 Super Call for Projects. And I believe uh, Matthew Helfand will uh, present that item. Matthew, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, good afternoon, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner. Um, a week ago, Dr. Cog released its first ever integrated request for proposals for transportation funding for three related programs that support mobility for communities such as older adults, individuals with disabilities, low income, veterans, and others. Um, older Americans Act, uh, FTA 5310 program, enhanced mobility of seniors and individuals with disabilities, and the Dr. Cog Transportation Improvement Program, uh, Human Services Transportation Set as well. Excuse me? Oh, I, I thought I heard something. Sorry. Uh, each of these funding programs are subject to uh, separate physical boundaries. Uh, for instance, uh, the, the Older Americans Act funds are eligible for projects in every county in, Dr. in the Dr. Cog region except for Boulder, which has its own area agency on aging, aging and separate funding. Uh, the FTA 5310 projects uh, are, are eligible within the uh, Denver Aurora urbanized area and uh, projects outside of those boundaries uh, may apply for funding through CDOT. Uh, and the HST funding is, is available within the Dr. Cog MPO boundaries. Uh, please see the attached map for reference and certainly we'd be able to, uh, we'd be happy to discuss any, any uh, concerns that or, or questions anyone has around those boundaries. Um, a mandatory workshop will be held on uh, this Wednesday, and uh, applications are due uh, January 7, 2022, and will be evaluated early next year. Uh, projects will commence on uh, July 1st, 2022, and implemented for one year. Uh, Travis Noon, uh, Dr. Cog, a senior program specialist, is here to provide some more detail, and we'd, we'd be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thanks, Matthew. Um, I was just Travis Noon here, Senior Pro Program Specialist at Dr. Cog. Just to add on to what Matthew said, I think he covered uh, most of it, but to add on um, sort of the amount of funding that's available, um, Dr. Cog's under the Older Americans Act, the, the Area Agency on Aging uh, typically awards around 2.5 to $3 million per year uh, to transportation projects. Um, the HST will be the remain, the HST, which is the tip set aside, uh, will be the remainder of the HST, which right now is at 1.5 million. Um, and then the 5310 money uh, is still sort of up in the air at this point, um, depending on how the increase shakes out through the apportionments um, in the infrastructure bill that's being signed. Um, right now it's looking like that's gonna be probably around a 25% increase nationally. Uh, really, it might be, for our part, we'll be close to around $2 million, might be higher, might be a little lower, really depends on how that all ends up shaking out. When you put all that together, it's about $6 million available for projects. Um, it's going to be capital projects, operating projects, and mobility management projects. The Older Americans Act funds are prioritized for services, so operating uh, expenses. Um, however, uh, depending on the proposals received, we might look at funding capital projects from that pot of money. As Matthew said, um, they are proposals are due on January 7th, and the intention is projects from this call for projects will be awarded starting uh, July 1 of 2022, and the projects will run for a year through June 30th, 2023. And then we are happy to answer any questions that the committee has. Are there any questions for Matthew or Travis? Um, please raise your hand or comment. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on to our next item. The uh, next informational briefing will be on the Advanced Mobility uh, Partnership, the annual update. And I understand Emily Lindsay will be making this presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chair. One second, let me get my PowerPoint up. 
All right. Can you all see my screen all right? Yes, we you can. Thank you. Awesome. Um, I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm the Transportation Technology Strategist at Dr. Cog in our Transportation Planning and Operations Division. Um, and I'm here to give you an update on the Advanced Mobility Partnership. I was here about a year ago to kind of get folks an idea of what we've been working on as part of this unique partnership. And I am back to kind of give you the latest and greatest. And I know we do have a few new faces here at TAC, so just really quickly, I just wanted to give you an overview of what AMP or the Advanced Mobility Partnership is. Um, it was really established uh, as a way that we could coordinate and collaborate on transportation technology issues in the region, kind of in support of the implementation of Mobility Choice Blueprint, which was wrapped up in 2019. And to support kind of this effort, there's two main groups that we engage with. There's an executive committee made up of executive leadership of the partner agencies and a working group that meets every month um, and is open to anyone that would like to participate. So if you're not on that list and you would like to be, please just shoot me a message in the chat or an email and we can get you added. So the Mobility Choice Blueprint itself really kind of let, let's set the foundation for the Advanced Mobility Partnership in the sense that it established this unique partnership between CDOT, Dr. Cog, RTD, and the Denver Metro Chamber. It really involved a variety of different focus areas, whether it was technology, mobility, quality of life, and it was really regional in nature. And so some of the key objectives from the blueprint focused on um, really a variety of areas, whether it was regional collaboration to shared mobility, mobility data, electrification, all kinds of good stuff. Um, and we wanted to kind of zero in on a couple of those focus areas to begin some initial work uh, since it was founded in late 2019. Uh, we've been going for almost two years and working in kind of these focus areas, which include shared mobility, system operations, and data and data sharing. All right. And I just wanted to hit some highlights for what we've been up to in 2021. We released this spring a bunch of different reports in support of the discovery around mobility data and data sharing. Um, and we kind of took a, a look at the state of the practice in the Denver region, what's happening at each of these partner agencies, what's happening at local jurisdictions, uh, to give us a better idea of kind of where we stand, what kind of data is being shared today, what kind of products and tools are out there for um, the support of transportation planning and implementation throughout the region. We also conducted a case study report to look at other regional collaboratives around <laughs> mobility data um, and technology and how they were kind of considering sharing data or they're currently sharing data among partner agencies, uh, really with a focus on that kind of multi-agency cross-jurisdictional type of data sharing. Uh, we also conducted a stakeholder survey report to learn more about the needs and opportunities that are related to mobility data sharing. You can check any of these out on the AMP website if you haven't seen them yet. Um, it's at advancedmobilitypartnership.org and I can drop that in the chat later. So uh, again, kind of in support of one of these major focus areas for the AMP, we recently completed actually last week, uh, a workshop series with Harvard's Kennedy School. And we did a three series workshop uh, for a couple hours each, each time over the course of three weeks to really build out some of the uh, basic information around mobility data sharing in the region. We got together to identify specific challenges, um, developed different use cases and told those kind of use case stories in a way that allowed us to better understand the needs and opportunities. And so just to give you kind of a, a preview of the work that we did over the last couple of weeks, we really looked again at those challenges, those use cases, and then thinking through the prioritization and classification of those use cases as we consider data supply and different projects moving forward. So we're working on putting this all together into a digestible format to share with other folks that weren't able to participate um, and we'll kind of have ongoing opportunities to weigh in. And in addition to our work on data and data sharing, of course, the working group uh, that meets every month really continues to serve as that major point of coordination and collaboration for all of the agencies throughout the region. Um, and we have covered a variety of topics. No meeting really ever looks the same from statewide electrification efforts. We've talked about transit emission dashboards and grant opportunities, um, universal trip plan planning and payment applications, transit priority, different data related projects, 
mobility hubs. We've heard from even outside agencies. We've had the city of Aspen come to share on their smart zone pilot in support of some of our explorations of curbside management. And then we've, uh, of course, invited um, folks from our universities uh, to share some of their research and work on things like drones. So TAC, as I'm sure you know, is represented on the AMP Working Group by Carson. Thank you very much for participating in those meetings every month. He does provide you all kind of that update at the end of each TAC meeting, just to make sure we're collaborating and coordinating between these different groups. Uh, but anyone is welcome to join. So if you would like to be added to that list, just let me know. Uh, but I'd certainly be happy to take questions or we can chat a little bit more if you feel like there's priorities coming out of the TAC that you're not sure where they're kind of being dealt with, um, or if there's any additional projects or priorities that we should consider kind of sharing with that other stakeholder group, I'd love to hear that as well. So that is all for me, uh, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Emily. Um, Carson, did you want to add anything? I don't, I think we'll skip your update at the end. So now's your chance. I think I'm okay, Mr. Chair. Thanks, Emily, for letting me know and help letting me keep uh, participating in this way. Thank you. Thank you, Carson. Are there any questions or comments for Emily or Carson? Please raise your hand. I am not seeing any hands. Uh, Raised, so uh, we'll move on to the next item here. Um, on there, so just a second here. Bring up my Linda. Um, next one is uh, C Dots Mountain Transit Service Update, and Jacob, I uh, understand you and Mike Timlin will be making this uh, uh, presentation. So, Jacob, if you'd start us off. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. I actually just have the easy job of doing introductions. Mike's going to do the hard work, but we did want to give you an update on what CDOT is doing with um, their bus tank service, their mountain service, particularly um, anticipating the upcoming winter. So it's my pleasure to have with us today, Mike Timlin, who is the Senior Manager of Mobility Operations for CDOT's Division of Transit and Rail, um, to give us a presentation. Take it away, Mike. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, for allowing me to come and uh, <clears throat> give the uh, uh, give the TAC a briefing on uh, what our winter operations plan and and, and also uh, kind of uh, give you a preview of uh, of our new of our new service that uh, we're planning to put in, which will be a, uh, a year-round type of service, uh, concentrating on the I-70 Mountain Corridor. I'm going to I'm going to share my screen here. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> can everybody see my screen? Yes, we can. Okay. Okay, very good. Uh, so this is our uh, our uh, mountain transit service update for this winter. We'll start off with um, um, the uh, snow stank service update for winter of 2021-22. Um, just to give you, if you weren't aware, uh, we made, we did a, we have a partnership uh, from 2020, from 2019 to 2020 uh, for, with Loveland Ski Area, A Basin and Steamboat Springs, City of Steamboat Springs slash the uh, Steamboat Ski and Resort Corporation. Uh, they contributed 60% of our operations. Uh, we contributed the 40% um, uh, through our fare box um, for operating, uh, you know, service on weekends, primarily Saturdays and Sundays from mid-December through to uh, the latter part of April in general. Uh, we're happy to say that all three uh, resorts are coming back to us this year, plus uh, Copper Mountain has uh, signed on. So uh, uh, we're very happy to have the four of them joining our service. So basically, um, our service uh, to the four ski resorts will, uh, uh, Loveland, Steamboat, and Copper Mountain will begin on uh, December 11th, which is coming up in another month. Uh, tickets will be able to go on sale on uh, on by Thanksgiving. Uh, 
A Basin is going to start a week later and run a week later through to May 1st as they historically have a later season anyway. So it's $12.50 $12 each way for Loveland A Basin and Copper, $20 each way to Steamboat Springs. This is, uh, we, you know, this was, uh, uh, we were helped out by the I-70 Coalition in helping price it right. Uh, this is the uh, price that they recommended, um, and they're very supportive of this. Steamboat will run through uh, the end of March, and hopefully this year we can do a whole season where back uh, in 2020, if you recall, the, uh, due to the pandemic, uh, the governor uh, closed all the ski resorts um, on the weekend of uh, March 14th, 15th. So um, I'll leave that open if, I'll, before I proceed to talk about our mountain shuttle program. Um, any questions on this? So the schedules, they'll be, you know, the schedules will be out shortly on when these things operate. Uh, they'll start out at Denver Union Station, uh, make a stop at the uh, Federal Station, Federal Center Station, um, and then uh, uh, and then continue up to each resort area on uh, Saturdays and Sundays. Plus, uh, there'll be a bonus trip on Martin Luther King Jr. birthday and President's Day weekend also, so there'll be an extra run. So for Loveland, A Basin, and Copper, the 41-day season where Steamboat will be a 17-day uh, because that becomes a two-day trip going to... Uh, up to steamboat. So with that, I'll, I'll are there pause any questions here for any questions. Yeah. Yeah. Are there any questions for Mike on this particular piece? Please raise your hand. Alex, go ahead. Um, thanks, Mike, for the presentation. Um, one quick question on the schedule. Um, are the, the Loveland A Basin and Copper buses, are those leaving Denver early yeah. enough in the morning to beat the worst of the traffic since they can't use the Mountain Express lanes? Yeah, we used uh, we used the data that we that we have, so we timed them right. So uh, the uh, uh, Steamboat Springs will be leaving at five uh, five thirty in the morning, five twenty five in the morning actually, so that they can arrive at uh, about nine thirty ten o'clock in the morning. So giving people two days of skiing uh, up there uh, or snowboarding, whatever they choose. Um, Loveland Steamboat and uh, I'm sorry, Loveland Air, A Basin and Copper will be leaving uh, between 6.05 and 6.25. Uh, and they'll be able to, uh, and two years ago, we didn't have a problem. Uh, it was time just right to get them there by 8.30 when the lifts open. Thank you, Alex. Yep. Um, any other questions from TAC or, or uh, TAC Holdernets? At this um, time, otherwise, I'll let Mike go ahead and continue. Go ahead, Mike. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, coming in uh, winter, uh, we were hoping to have this uh, uh, set up and launched by mid uh, December, also. But I think the uh, um, the delay in delivery of our vehicles is going to have an effect on it. We're hoping we can get word that the vehicles are being delivered here. Um, but anyway, uh, the new sh uh, shuttle service that we're pl planning to launch uh, this winter uh, is meant to augment the bus tank service and will we'll we'll uh, operate on peak travel days on Fridays through Sunday and holidays. They'll, it'll be, as they're augmenting the uh, current bus tank service onto uh, uh, on I-70, it'll be essentially hourly service in the mountain corridors on those select days starting at about 6 a.m., between 6 a.m. and about 9 p.m. Uh, on Fridays, Saturdays, and Sundays. Uh, we'll be using small vans. Uh, they've been ordered. Uh, they're 11 passenger Ford Transit XLs. Um, 
they'll be able to use the mountain express lanes or the peak period shoulder lanes through Clear Creek County, which will uh, have a uh, impact on the uh, on-time performance of these things. Um, and initial, so, and then the initial service will launch from Denver Union Station to Avon uh, with stops also at the uh, uh, Federal Center Transit Station. A uh, lot has been asked about, are we going to be, you know, are we gonna be actually uh, competing with the private shuttles? Um, they don't believe that we are mainly because we don't concentrate on the airport uh, or do, uh, you know, do uh, direct drop-offs at the resorts. Uh, we're using the um, uh, primary, we're using the uh, regular stations that Bustang operates out of and using our relationships with the uh, uh, transit agencies along the corridor. Um, as I said, um, target launch is winter 2021. And our purpose is to operate frequent, reliable, affordable peak period I-70 public transit. Hourly service both directions to allow riders the freedom of movement when, when, their, when their schedule uh, is, uh, is in play. Uh, fast and reliable, we'll be able to use the uh, Mountain Express lanes. Flexible, we'll be able to adjust the schedules and routes as needed. Uh, there, it will be affordable, providing public transit type fare structure on the corridor, and then uh, connected, capitalize on our connections to the local public transit systems and safety. Uh, even though <clears throat> these drivers will not be required to have uh, uh, CDLs, they will still uh, they will still be trained appropriately, and their uh, driving habits will be followed very carefully. We're meant to re uh, reduce the reliance on private automobiles that are traveling in that corridor. In fact, that's, <sighs> that's our, our, our main focus is to um, attack, you know, the uh, VMT on, on the corridor. And we know that the result will reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So why the vans? Uh, everybody knows that there's a severe CDL driver shortage and uh, that's probably not going to uh, be mitigated for some time to come. No CDL will be required to, be, to drive the vans. Uh, liability insurance and maintenance is cheaper. Uh, they can operate in the Mountain Express lanes, have a better uh, fuel economy, obviously, although uh, that's kind of a trade-off where uh, we're only gonna be used putting 11 people on the, on the van versus 51 on a bus, so it's it's not uh, it's not quite averaging out the same, and of course the lower fleet acquisition costs. So our goals are a proof of concept, start the service small, grow service as it matures, more frequency, more uh, locations to operate out of, demonstrate ridership for for potential future mass transit in the corridor. Uh, again, reducing uh, VMT and greenhouse gas emissions, uh, maintaining a sustainable operation plan for 40% fare box, but obviously like busting, uh, maintain at least a 20% fare box recovery. Operate a strict res res reservation only on the, uh, on the system, fixed route station to station to keep our operating costs low to start. And of course, collaborate with the mountain resort shuttles. <clears throat> uh, it will increase our person trip capacity on the corridor. Uh, it'll increase the uh, uh, seating capacity from on on uh, from about 408. That it will happen on uh, December 12th to 672 seats on those peak days, and we know it'll be responsive to a public desire for more service in the corridor. So uh, uh, just a quick update on our fleet, 16 vans, uh, 10 initial that are currently, um, uh, that are currently ordered. Uh, the the uh, funding mechanism we're using is uh, uh, the Office of Innovative Mobilities uh, piece of their uh, highway users tax fund that they get for operations. 
um, will be paying the capital costs of these vans. And then uh, 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 the uh, operations will be covered by right now by the uh, CRISA funds, FTA CRISA funds that we've received. Um, if uh, CRISA is the Cor Cor Coronavirus Response and Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act. Um, it's also, I was notified by FTA Region 8, that's no staying, is um, uh, being, being recommended to FTA headquarters as a, as a funded project directly supporting conservation of recreational and wildlife areas. So we're very proud of that. So yeah, here's the, I'm not gonna read through this. So there are custom Ford Transit XLs. Uh, they'll be full wheelchair lift equipped. Um, and I just wanna point out that right now there is no battery electric option at this time. Uh, Ford uh, uh, engineers have told us that they believe they'll have a very viable uh, battery electric option in about five years, which will be great because the uh, useful life expectancy of these vans are going to be about six years. So we'll, we're committed to trans, transition over to battery electric when they become available. <clears throat> Just six additional vans are going to be, we're going to purchase with old FTA funds that are, uh, uh, that are just sitting there that were uh, brought, that were given back for uh, past projects that uh, didn't, uh, uh, that were, that were not uh, funded. Um, and then of course, transition to EV. Just a little bit of background of where uh, the West Line has been. Uh, you can see the, the growth of, uh, of service here in the, um, uh, that we experienced on the West Line. Uh, we handled our highest total in the, we handled uh, 2019, 71,000 riders on the West Line uh, with three daily round trips and 193 riders per day average, which was uh, way beyond what, what, what our uh, expectations were. Uh, part of the reason, part of the problem was we had, uh, as everybody experienced the same thing as well as RTD has, we had a shortage of drivers in that 2019, early 2020, I'm sorry, 2018 to 2019 area. And um, uh, we uh, left a lot of people. Um, and uh, so our customer loyalty suffered. Um, and the and when and as you know, when uh, you don't do you don't have the expectations of your customers, uh, you know uh, they remember. So as a we're trying to you know uh, this is our attempt to get the uh, uh, more seats on the uh, uh, on the corridor, and as our day, our service trips have increased, so has our ridership. So uh, this is uh, this program has gotten the the. Uh, a lot of support from the I-70 coalition and the communities up in the mountain, uh, in the mountain uh, communities. So 16 round trips on peak days, 6 a.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, on uh, December 12th, we're adding a, another Bustang trip to Grand Junction. So we'll have four daily trips on the corridor each way. And then there'll be 12 shuttle trips in between, uh, st start uh, operating between Avon and Denver, uh, increasing the available seats to 672 uh, during those peak days. It, these are the proposed shuttle stops to start. And as the uh, service takes off, I see the ability to start service out of other locations like Boulder, uh, Thornton, uh, South uh, Douglas County, um, Centennial, uh, who knows, you know, uh, we think it's going to take off um, probably slowly at first, but uh, eventually <clears throat> uh, we think that it's going to work very, very well. Uh, the fare structure, since it's a guaranteed seat reservation only, we're um, We've at, we're going to sell the tickets uh, specifically on, on the service at 20 cents per uh, mile compared to 17 cents per mile on Bustang. Uh, so these are examples of the fares. So Avon to Denver will be $20. 
uh, or Yvonne Denver, Yvonne Vale to Denver, 20 bucks. And the, the tickets will be able to be used on bus staying as well, but except, but they won't be guaranteed if somebody, if they, if it works better for them or if they miss their, their trip. Uh, our branding attempt was, uh, we wanted branding that was legible, approachable, and easy to understand and cohesive with the existing Bustang brand family, evoking speed and agility in branding. That's what our, our uh, uh, subcommittee of the, of the Transit and Rail Advisory Committee advised us to do. So we think we did that with Pegasus. <clears throat> so that's our branding. I know a lot of you have already seen this. So our communications plan, we plan to have a press release, obviously. A social, we'll do a lot of social media and regular uh, media locally in Denver uh, and up in the mountain communities along I-70, as well as the Denver Post. And also we are going to participate in the National Western Stock Show in the parade and several events during the uh, show's run this, this January. So uh, we're gonna get the word out on the, uh, on all of our services uh, in, in, in the coming January, in the coming months. So our immediate next steps, final, finalize the vehicle livery. We've already done that, but we, we're gonna share that when the time is right. Uh, continue stakeholder outreach like I'm doing today um, and then launch the service in winter. In the future, consider service expansion and origin destination additions, capitalize on the flexibility with vans to be able to do that. Um, and this one is uh, kind of, we're calling our phase two. And to coordinate with the Floyd Hill, Floyd Hill construction team in region one, CDOT, uh, to help provide congestion mitigation service. That'll involve um, some uh, uh, adding of stops and having daily departures uh, when the uh, Floyd Hill construction team is ready to proceed uh, in that way with uh, by adding more uh, stage stops in uh, Jeff Jefferson County uh, to help with residents getting to where they need to go around the construction and traffic mitigation. Um, we're looking at additional park and ride st uh, stops along the way also for that phase two of, uh, of uh, Pegasus. Anybody, and that's, that ends my presentation, if anyone has any questions. Thank you, Mike. Um, I see Alex Heigreid has, has raised uh, his hand. If Alex, go ahead. Um, one more question. With the governor's proposal for um, statewide fare-free transit next year during the high ozone season, if the legislature does indeed fund that, would that also make busting services free next summer? Yes. Great, thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, Deborah Basket, you had a question or a comment? Hi, Mike. I'm going to take advantage that you might know the answer to my question related to the busting. I work for the city of Westminster, and I was at US 36 and Sheridan the other day, and I looked up and I saw that there is a sign for the busting. I've been clicking around on the website and I can't figure out which line stops at US 36 in Sheridan. The, the line that stops there uh, runs during the summer and that's the Estes Park service. Okay, um, so thank you so much for all the information. If you could help people understand that there's a service there sometimes um, in the summer months, yeah. it would be awesome. And we can talk offline about how the city of Westminster might be able to assist you in the timings right for that. Now, I was just completely puzzled because I couldn't figure out. Yeah, that, well, uh, yeah, that, that you know, uh, we'll get, we'll get, I'll tell you what, we'll get the city involved. Uh, we plan next year, we, uh, we started, we did the service from uh, uh, the weekend of July 3rd and 4th um, and ran through the end of October to, S we, it was weekend service to Estes Park. Um, next year, we plan to start the service again, and we'll make sure that the city is involved with that planning. Okay, well, effort. we'll just we'll just figure out how to get the word out. Thank you very much. Okay, you bet. Thank you, Deborah. Uh, Brian, 
Whenever you had a question or a comment? Yeah, I do. Um, thanks for the information quite a bit. Um, one question that I had is, uh, what performance metrics are you using to determine success in these um, various programs? Is it number of seats filled? Is it total ridership? And how are you communicating that? Um, well, we have to give a quarterly report to the uh, Transportation Commission, and our performance metrics are uh, based on um, number one is uh, fare box recovery. That's our number one performance metric that the uh, Transportation Commission has placed upon us in our uh, uh, <clears throat> policy directive. We have to maintain a 20% fare box recovery. We've done that from day one. Um, uh, obviously, when we during the pandemic, we weren't doing it when we started up service last restarted service uh, from a three month hiatus in uh, June from March to June, uh, but we were rebuilding it so we're back up to uh, we're at about 30% right now but uh, we also operate our other performance metrics is uh, obviously downtime of vehicles. Um, uh, uh, you know, complaints per uh, th uh, per hundred per thousand passengers. Um, <clears throat> we track that very very closely, and of course, maintenance failures uh, per hundred thousand miles uh, of uh, operation. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Brian. Um, Carol. Do you have, have yes, a question uh, or comment? Go ahead. Yeah, um, Michael, like Deborah, I had seen some busting signs in places where I wasn't sure what was happening. And I was wondering, like the one in Lyons, is that part of the Estes Park um, trip in the summer as well? Yes. Yes, that is. That was that one we put in, uh, we tested it a uh, couple of years, you know, for a couple of years. Uh, we've decided to put it on full time. Uh, Lions, uh, since we go right through Lions, it did. It made no sense not to make a stop there for people. So that's what we did. Thank you. Thank you, Carol. For these stops that we're just asked about, Mike, I, I did have a question, Is there, if it's only seasonal, do you take the signs down then when they're not? Yeah, um, we could, or we could put up, yeah, we could put up a sign. We could, we probably need to put up signs that uh, are more seasonal in nature uh, since we're doing that. Yeah, or, or at least the, the months that they're running or times that they're running, something so, yeah. so, sounds like a little more information might be, be worthy to have at those locations. Yeah, that's a good point. Are there any other comments or questions uh, from the TAC or TAC alternates? Please raise your hand. Not seeing any. Thank you for the presentation, Mike. And uh, yes, thank, thanks again for having me. And we appreciate the information. Um, we'll move on to our next item, uh, which gets us into our administrative items. Um, it's time uh, for you guys to find my replacement as our uh, uh, my two-year stint comes to an end here as chair. Therefore, we need to have a nominating panel to develop the slate of elections for the Transportation Advisory Committee chair and the vice chair for 22-23. It is a two-year term. Um, Jacob, I'm going to ask you to provide some additional information there. So, Jacob, go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. And can you confirm that you're seeing our committee guidelines yes, on the screen? we're seeing Okay, them. great. Yeah, so first of all, I can't believe that two years has gone by and that we have to replace Kent. Um, and it's only because we have to, but it is in our committee guidelines. Um, as you see, our, our committee guidelines are pretty brief on this topic. Committee members shall elect a chair and vice chair to serve two-year terms, um, which Kent and our vice chair, Steve Durian, are, are concluding as of the end of the December meeting. 
Um, we hold elections during the fourth quarter. We're going to hold elections at our December meeting, um, obviously in odd numbered years in 2021 to elect our chair and vice chair. So we'll do this in a two part process as our chair alluded to. Um, at this meeting, um, I'm soliciting volunteers for a nominating panel. And this has been our traditional way that we do this. I'm looking for about say three to five folks um, who are willing to volunteer to be on a nominating panel. And the nominating panel has two jobs. One is to kind of help me solicit the membership of TAC to try and get some nominations, folks who are interested in running for chair or vice chair. And then once we have those candidates, the nominating panel um, typically works through those, those nominations and recommends a slate um, of, you know, of nominations for chair and vice chair um, to the TAC, again, that we'll do at the December meeting um, to hold the actual election. Um, so again, looking for somewhere between three to five folks uh, to serve on this panel. Um, again, pretty informal, you know, um, one month of work um, to get ready for our election at the December meeting. So are you looking for some uh, people to raise their hand, uh, Jacob, to... Yes, I am, I am looking for some you brave souls. So <laughs> I'm looking for some brave souls to help me with this. This is the uh, first time we're asking this cat question virtually, I can see. So, uh, Rick, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Rick, you're on mute. Well, I didn't know if I had to. Yeah. <laughs> I'm happy to help. And okay. uh, Jacob, I, I think I was helping you last time or maybe the time before. So yeah, put me on the list to help. I'm, I'm not interested in, in uh, trying to fill your shoes, Kent, but uh, happy to help on the nominating committee. Thank you. Rick. Yeah, thank you, Rick. You did serve two years ago and I appreciate your help again. Thank you. Ron, you had a comment or question? Yes, Mr. Chair, Jacob, I'm, I'm not volunteering. Um, oh, thank so goodness. I don't, I don't think that would be appropriate. I, I thought it might be helpful maybe if you have an idea of sort of the time commitment or level of effort for this work, and that might help some people make a decision about whether they're able and willing to participate. Yeah, that's a good clarification. Thanks, Ron. So again, the process we start at this meeting, we conclude with the election at the December meeting. Uh, between now and then, a couple things will happen. I will send out a solicitation to the TAC members directly, um, inviting all of you to submit your, you know, sort of email statement of interest to run for chair or vice chair. Um, so I will do that directly. So really, the nominating panel will kind of help me do that if we hear that, hey, you should follow up with so-and-so or you should reach out to so-and-so, you know, ask the panel for help with that. Uh, really, the work is once we start getting some names in, uh, the nominating panel, we may need to meet once or twice, excuse me, once or twice virtually um, over the next month just to kind of work through the candidates and come up with a slate. So in terms of, you know, time commitment level of effort, it's pretty easy. Time commitment should just be, you know, hour or two uh, between now and the December meeting. So it's not a heavy lift, uh, but it's certainly important to our committee process. Thank you, Jacob. David uh, Gaspers, go ahead. I was just volunteering uh, to help. More than happy to. Great. Thank you, David. Appreciate that. Uh, Bill Soroy. Uh, similarly, I'll volunteer to help as well. Great. Thank you. Thank and you, Bill. Alex Hyde-Wright. Same. Okay. Thank you. So that gives us at least four members. I think that's about what you had last time, wasn't it, Jacob? Yep. We did have four last time. So I think that's a good number. So I appreciate all of you that are uh, have volunteered and I will follow up with you. Thank you very much. Great. And Bill, I see your hand still raised. Did you have additional comment? Nope, just haven't right lowered it yet. Okay, thank you. All right. Um, please note the 2022 TAC meeting schedule in your packet and uh, the meetings will continue uh, as virtual until further notice. Also, our, our next TAC meeting is December 20th. Um, um, that'll be coming up. Are there any other items, uh, member comments, uh, other matters that need to come before the TAC today? Uh, please raise your hand. Ron, please. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Just um, for anyone who 
hasn't been following the news very much recently. The um, uh, House the House of Representatives did pass the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, um, and the president signed that into law today or is signing it into law today. I'm not sure if it's actually happened. It was scheduled to happen today. Um, so I would refer you back to um, materials that we've distributed and discussed at TAC meetings um, over the course of a couple meetings about kind of the transportation portions of the of that of that bill that reauthorized the FAST Act and added significant new funding and some new grant programs. There will be a lot more to come. We'll continue to dig in and distribute information. We'll probably have some conversations with you all about some of the grant opportunities and and I'm starting to give some thought about how we might process requests for letters of support from Dr. Cog for grant requests, because I suspect there will be a lot of those. There will be a lot of the new grant programs rolling out over the next year and beyond. So um, just a lot of work for all of us on top of everything else we've all been working on, but just wanted to remind you uh, of that work and, and uh, certainly reach out if you have specific questions, but refer back to those uh, previous TAC packets for some additional detail information. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ron. That, um, that will uh, bring a lot of money into hopefully the, the uh, Dr. Cog region for us to, to advance our uh, re regional transportation plan. Uh, seeing no other hands up at this time, um, I will go ahead and uh, adjourn the meeting. So we are adjourned at 301. Thank you everyone for attending. And we'll see you December 20th. Thanks, Kat. So long. Bye. Thank you.